hello everyone and welcome to this session. Um, I'm Juliet Dobson, I'm the managing editor of the BMJ family at the um, BMJ Publishing Group. And today's session is about incorporating inclusive language into publications and style guides. Um, so as we all know, it's, um, it's important that organisations value and embrace the use of inclusive language. And the practice of incorporating inclusive language should be fluid and ongoing with frequent updates and mindful community input. So during this session, we're going to have a, a panel session with my colleagues here to learn about how their organisations are leading and, and incorporating inclusive language into their style guides. So I'm going to hand over to the panel to introduce themselves. Uh, Lucy, would you like to start? Lucy Bunham, um, I'm Managing Editor of The Lancet, um, which is part of Elsevier. Um, so I'm responsible for the team that copy edits um, papers after acceptance across the Lancet journals, and I've also been involved in putting together our inclusive language guide internally. Hi, uh, I'm Anna Nowitzki. I am a sub-editor team leader for the front half of Nature, um, which is so journalistic content, including news and book reviews and news features and comments. And I also wrote our uh, Nature Front Half Inclusive Language Style Guide, uh, which was later rolled out to the entire Nature portfolio and is now being incorporated into the Springer Nature Wide Style Guide. Hi, my name is Kim Eggleton. I work for IOP Publishing. Um, I was, until very recently, a Research Integrity and Inclusion Manager. Um, but I'm also here with a slightly different hat on. I'm a part of a working group called C4DISC which is currently putting together some inclusive style guides for use across the publishing industry. So while I will talk a little bit about IOP publishing, I think it's more the C4 disc hat that I'm wearing today. Great, thank you. So we're going to run the session um, as a sort of Q&A uh, Q uh, panel discussion. Um, and then there'll be plenty of time for questions from the audience at the end. I'm just going to say we, we're not going to use the app, so if you've got any questions, just keep those in mind, and at the end there'll be a roving mic, and um, you can ask us some questions then. So I'm just going to move on to this. Um, so um, not all organisations have the same sort of copy editing resources. Um, so could you give some insights into how you compile and update your style guides and what process is involved? Um, Anna, do you want to kick off? Um, yeah, so uh, Nature Spring, and Spring of Nature obviously have a lot of resources generally, but our, my project was actually quite small. Um, and basically did it by myself um, after, it was about 2017, I think, we started. Um, and basically, uh, I kind of came, I was given the, the remit of putting this guide together because I had a pre-existing uh, pre interest in inclusive language and I sort of had kept up and, and was reading about, about uh, the issues. Um, and that's how I went about compiling it, basically. I did lots of research um, looking at uh, uh, issues on, on various strands, so race and ethnicity and nationality, uh, gender and sexuality, uh, disabilities and health, um, and uh, just sort of general questions. And I looked at um, other resources that were out there, like the consciousstyleguide.com, uh, I think the div diversitystyleguide.com, uh, uh, offerings from Arts Council England, the, Glo the Glo Global Press Journal, um, a resource called the radicalcopyeditor.com and just saw, um, and also like more kind of um, targeted uh, groups like Stonewall and the uh, American Black Journalists Association and other kind of similar groups like that. And I kind of synthesized that into topics that we cover. Um, I picked out the guidance for that and then um, made a document and shared it with our uh, Nature Diversity Task Force to see if anyone had any comments and um, other editors just to see that it was seemed to be on track and then we rolled it out um, to our publication um, and then it sort of gained some traction and was rolled out to sort of slightly wider uh, set of journals. Um, and I kind of, we've kept it in-house, I haven't made it public because I am just one person and I didn't, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily have insight into all of the um, the fields and the sensitive aspects um, myself, so I'm a bit kind of weary about, leery about say, putting it out into the world and saying this is how you should uh, approach the topics. But um, the wider group, the, the wider 
uh, version that is going to be made public is getting buy-in from uh, the various um, employee networks, like the Spring and Nature Black Employee Network and the uh, Spring and Nature Pride um, are all kind of vetting it. Um, so hopefully that will be kind of supported by um, a wider range of voices, basically. Great, thank you, Anna. Um, and Lucy, could you talk a bit about what you do at the Lancet? I'm sure it's been quite a similar um, process to what Anna described. Um, we had a slightly bigger group of, um, it was mainly copy editors, get together to create this guide. Um, again, kind of as a, as a labor of love, really, rather, and, and, and out of a feeling that there was a need for it. Um, and uh, yeah, so we split up into, uh, into smaller groups within that, focusing on the different topics like race and gender and um, health conditions um, and other topics. Um, so in some cases, um, including people who had lived experience of the points that were being discussed. And they went away, did their research. So again, good news is that, you know, there's lots of style guides out there that cover these topics um, very comprehensively. There's no shortage of people to in the media talking about um, what the implications of language. Um, so it's very easy to, you know, look at a range of different uh, of different opinions and um, and then bring them back to the group for discussion. Um, and yeah, once we'd find we kind of compiled, um, we, once we compiled a, a bunch of notes within that group, we shared them a little more widely, got some feedback from the wider team, and then as similar to Anna um, from employee uh, networks within the within the wider company. Um, to kind of check that we were on the right track. Um, yeah, that's about it. Great, thank you, Lucy. Um, Kim, did you have anything to add? Yeah, so uh, IOP, um, we, we still don't really have one. What we started out with quite some years ago now was, was really a list of terms not to use, and that actually came from one of our typesetter kind of, you know, partners. Um, and then when I started in the inclusivity role, I happened to come across this list and sort of thought this isn't really ideal, not, not because there was anything wrong with it, but because it didn't really offer any alternatives and also mm -hmm. there wasn't any context given around it. Um, and through working with C4DISC, what they've been able to create, which is due for release in the next week or two, is, um, is essentially a style guide that gives you a, a, a resource to be used by authors, by publishers, um, across 12 major categories, including, like you said, health, of sexuality, um, gender, race, ethnicity, class, socioeconomic status, all different kinds of things um, but that, that can be used by publishers who've maybe uh, are sort of halfway into this journey or not even mm -hmm. into this journey, don't have the resources or don't feel, this is how we felt at IOP, was that we actually didn't have the, the kind of skills and knowledge to develop this in-house ourselves. Mm -hmm. We didn't feel comfortable of speaking for people where we didn't really have the lived experience so our intention is very much to use the c4 disc guidelines um mm -hmm. yeah and that sort of leads perfectly into our next question which is that rules on inclusive language um understandably need to be very flexible and because it's such a fast evolving area so how do you manage that challenge of continually evolving and developing your style guides um, Do I kick off? Um, so I think, um, yeah, for, well, for one thing, we, we have actually have a separate style guide for inclusive language. It sounds like that seems to be the case with a lot because um, the main style guide, which it tends to be, obviously you're going to be thinking about context and you're going to have some need for nuance and flexibility, but there is there are more kind of strict rules, whereas the inclusive language guide um, you will need you will ideally want to go into a bit more detail um, as you were saying Kim about the the context mm. um, the the different situations in which a word might or might not be appropriate or maybe describe some of the controversies out there so that people are informed when it comes to making a decision also I guess it has a rule in a role in um, you know just um, raising awareness within the, within the team, within the company mm -hmm. as well. You know, there might be situations where we've thought um, that uh, maybe a, a term is unlikely to come up, but because it's part of the wider discussion, we think it's important to include. Um, so we have this separate guide. It's a lot 
but you know it's, it's a lot longer than it would be if it was incorporated into the main guide and we basically have a, a rolling copy that's open we can constantly add updates and suggestions to it um, as they come in as we get feedback or as things uh, as editors deal with different topics um, in their day-to-day -to -day work um, and then every so often we kind of meet to discuss those um, and consolidate it and release a new version of the style guide. Um, so that, yeah, and then, then again, we're lucky to have um, people involved who, similar to what Anna said, they kind of have a genuine interest, existing interest in the topic. So they're out there reading about it anyway as part of their their day-to-day -day lives. Um, so they're gonna be coming into contact with um, with new points of view and able to feed those into the group. Um, I guess if you know if, if you don't necessarily have those people within your organisation, though, there's going to be um, there's going to be uh, you know you, you have to find out how your organisation's values are going to be supported by inclusivity, and you can kind of create motivation to mm -hmm. um, to take part in that. I think. Thank you, Lucy. Anna, over to you. Yeah, again, it's quite quite similar to what Lucy said. Um, I remain the main point of contact for Nature Front Half's Inclusive Style Guide, and people can email me or get in touch with me um, if they have a question or if they have advice um, or you know if they want to debate uh, or bring my attention to anything. And um, usually, I will kind of go. If some, often it'll be a question that I've already uh, thought about, so I just tell them like how we came to this decision and you know update the notes to make them clearer if necessary. Um, or I can go away and research what the what a correct answer would be or a useful answer, um, and then I'll update the guide. And I always like make notes, to, so I don't like periodically release a new guide. I just change the words, and then um, I have a log at the back to say you know, what's been updated when. Um, and I think it's quite, it can be quite difficult because I don't know if it's just an editorial thing or specifically a science thing, but people often want kind of one correct answer to their question and say to, that they can apply across the board. And that's just not how this works, really, because people, we're talking about people's lived experiences and their identities, and people's identities are intersectional and they you know, have different ways of approaching things and different needs. So you really have to, um, I, I read an article recently that said you have to let go of being correct and lean into caring, basically. So you have to take the time to look into the context of what you're writing about and find out why people might object to a certain term or prefer another term and have the flexibility to use sort of maybe one name for a group in one article and another name in another article. Um, for, for example, um, a, a clinician writing about um, autism will probably will be more likely to use autism, sp autism spectrum disorder whereas uh, someone who themselves uh, is autistic will be more likely to talk about aut just autism. Um, and we don't need to kind of come in and say, you can't describe yourself like that. We have to kind of let them, um, you know, make, make that decision for themselves. And we uh, I try and encourage everybody in copy editing and wider editorial to take that approach rather than being kind of rigid about it. Thank you. Um, Kim, over to you. Um, I think really just echoing the previous points made, it needs to be an ongoing and open dialogue and we need to be really clear that feedback is welcomed at any time and I think potentially consider that if people might not want to, might not necessarily want to give that feedback, sharing that it's from a lived experience. So I think mm -hmm. it's also worth thinking about sort of anonym anonymous options for people to get in touch. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that we've certainly thought about. Um, some of our feedback comes from quite differing directions as well. We've we've had authors kind of contact us and say we're not sure about how we should word this, and we've kind of tried to go mm. away and help them. We've also had reviewers who've seen a manuscript and sort of said, "I urge caution in the way that this is being described." Um, so it's it's not just having that one route of feedback as well. Mm. It's making sure staff are really um, empowered to pass mm. on feedback and feel that they can re raise feedback as well rather than mm. kind of just seeing one one particular route. That's incredibly unhelpful advice though because it means <laughs> it's it's really sort of floopy and difficult to get your arms around and you need to you need to be constantly mm. open and revising and as you say in this kind of industry we like to have an answer and, mm. and that's that's definitely our experience with the kind of copy editing typesetting especially using third parties. They want a definitive list mm, yeah. and there is no room for kind of 
judgment to be made or context to be applied and I'll hold our hands up and say we don't really have a, a solution there yet. It's, it's probably something that's going to sit more within editorial for a judgment kind of to be applied rather than something that can be passed into what we see as our kind of production um, mm. section of the workflow. Great, thank you. I feel like we've sort of touched on this already quite a lot in terms of the next question, but we've spoken about how authors have specific views on how their articles are written. Um, and so how do you handle that feedback and incorporate that into your style guide? And are there any specific approaches that you take towards authors versus other ways of updating your style guide? Um, again, for us, it depends on the context of the article. Um, if it's uh, something that's in nature's voice, so it's like a journalist writing it, we will be a lot stricter about saying this is how we say it in nature. But where if it's a commissioned article which is in the voice of the author, so an academic or another e expert writing in, we'll take a lot more into account like how if they're talking about themselves or a group that they um, are identify with, uh, we will be a lot, a lot more flexible about letting them uh, describe for themselves. Sometimes we may kind of ha include a footnote saying nature, uh, you know, knows that this is, you know, not necessarily applying to everybody, but um, this is, uh, you know, how it's been, how we've chosen to use it in this this instance. Um, and sometimes you have to go back and say, sorry, you we you can't say that. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But um, if it's if it's someone talking about their own group, then we would take take their feedback into into account definitely. Thank you. Um, just to add to that really I think making it clear when that when it is a self-described term as well that other other people mm. might not choose to use that language to describe themselves and I think we've we've made we've had a couple of articles where we've put kind of a note at the top to say that we recognize this might not be how you know everybody chooses to describe themselves but this is this author's choice and that you know mm -hmm. kind of that's, that's absolutely fine with us um, I guess it's also dependent a little bit on the subject as well, so sort of in linguistic studies or maybe sort of from a social science perspective looking at how a particular group's maybe been treated historically, there's a very genuine reason for including certain terms um, and also when you're quoting, in especially in qualitative work as well. Um, so again, that's that nuance that needs to be applied that you, you can't kind of have that, that direct rule that applies to everything. Um, but in our experience, when we have reached out to authors and kind of said, you can't say that, um, or we, we suggest strongly that you reconsider <laughs> the language that you've chosen. Um, every single instance, they've been like, oh, wow, okay, sorry, give us, you know, give us some direction. Um, mm -hmm. I've, I've, in my experience, anyway, I've never had any resistance. The, the feeling was genuinely, we do not want to do any harm, and that's certainly the perspective that we come from, and I think that is broadly shared across the academic community. That's not answering your question at all. I've, I've deviated. But, um, no, that, that's but absolutely fine. Useful, anyway. <laughs> that's a really interesting answer. Thank you. Um, Lisa, did you have anything to add? Um, yeah, no, I, I agree with, with Kim. I think authors generally have been open to, um, to listening when it comes to inclusive language. They, they're, they're, they're open to it. Um, I guess in cases, um, you know, like many publications, we've been trying to commission and invite more submissions that are on relevant topics like gender and race. And when we have authors who are specifically writing about those topics because they're specialists in, in the subject, we kind of want to learn from them, which is, mm. which is great. So when we, we have people editing those, um, those, those papers, then maybe they can feed in things, discussions they, they've had with the author about the language. Mm. Um, and it also, Feedback from authors has also helped to highlight when our guide isn't clear enough. So say a copy mm -hmm. editor has, um, you know, applied the rule a little bit too enthusiastically um, without kind of thought about the nuance. The feedback from the author has helped to clarify that we need to uh, explain in the guide situations where um, a term might be appropriate or not. So I think the one that springs to mind is um, we included in the guide that it might not be appropriate to say someone identifies as so-and-so, uh, a woman or a man, if they're a trans person, because that would imply that they're not a woman or a man. Mm. Um, however, in some contexts, uh, so an author raised that um, I using identifies as um, was correct in, the, um, in, in a study that they used, um, it, it, 
to say that um, so and so percentage of, of, of men identified as gay. So um, in that instance, they were talking about data collection, they were mm. self identifying um, as, as gay, not all men who have sex with men identify as gay. And in that, that um, so in that context, it was um, appropriate to, mm. to use the term. Um, so we modified the entry to reflect that. Mm. Thank you, Lucy. Um, so, yeah, so it's dependent on context and, and also article type. Yeah. Um, and so it would be really interesting to hear a little bit about how you handle different types of articles. So, as you've alluded to there, research has very specific data sets um, versus, say, an opinion piece or, or an essay or something that's a bit more discursive. So, um, how do you handle that in your style guides? Um, Anna, do you want to start? <laughs> Um, yeah, um, I mean, as I said, we just try to make it clear in the style guides that um, what is kind of nature, nature's approach and what is a bit more flexible. For example, um, in you know, as as nature, like an institution, we wouldn't kind of spontaneously refer to someone as queer, but if they wish to re refer to themselves that way, that you know, we would use that. Um, so in our journalistic content, our style for kind of um, is LGBT plus. Uh, we don't really use the Q because it's not like our Thing to use, um, but if someone writing an opinion column wants to you say LGBTQ+, or queer, or whatever they, they want to use, and that they're from the community, we allow that, absolutely. Um, and our, uh, our style guide kind of reflects, like, there are, there are points where it will say, you know, in-house, we say this, externally we allow, you know, mm -hmm. variation in this way. Um, and we kind of have our we don't deal with, like, in my section, we don't deal with research articles, um, okay. but I do often get questions about how that would be covered, and I, I kind of defer to what's standard practice in the field, um, generally, unless there's something, like, obviously horrible. Um, but, um, again, you, when it's, you're talking about data collection, you can't, and, and you know, the, if you're you know, doing a study on ethnicity or something, and you, you can't impose categories and say, oh, well, this this says Asian, but we have to say South Asian or, or whatever. Um, we have to use the categories that they have mm -hmm. used because otherwise it's, it's not reflecting um, the process correctly. Um, so again, that's, a, I think, a long-winded way to say it all depends, and we try and make <laughs> clear as clear as possible um, what factors it depends on and yeah. what direction you need to, kind of what process you need to follow. Um, but again, it, it does mean the style guide is a lot longer than it would be if we were mm. able to just say, do this. Um, but I think, as I said, it's, it's worth taking the time whenever these questions come up to understand what you're really talking about and what you, and, and why you need to use a particular form of words or um, refer to categories in a certain way. Um, and, and yeah, it's definitely worth taking that time um, to ensure you, you don't do any harm and you do represent things uh, accurately. Mm. Kim, did you want to come just, in on that? Just that I think there's an, there's an added um, sort of group that could easily get forgotten, and that's that it's not just about the content we publish, it's also about the way we communicate with authors, it's about our marketing materials, it's mm -hmm. about our websites, and we've traditionally thought about this purely from that content angle, as in, you know, this is what an author said, are we going to allow them to say that? We haven't really taken much responsibility for how we ourselves use that kind of language, and we're trying to think about how we can embed some of that sort of more inclusive thinking and communication within our own company as well and mm. thinking about you know presentations and that kind of thing and not not just from a, an inclusive language perspective but from a, an accessibility perspective as yeah. well um, and I would just urge yeah anyone that's thinking about a style guide it just don't think it just applies to the the content mm. it's, it's also really useful in that kind of marketing anything outward facing yeah. Um, yeah. or anything inward facing as well, any kind of communication. Mm. Yeah, thank you, that's really useful advice. Um, so, um, Anna, you talked about this a little bit in detail in your first um, answer where we were talking about external input and peer review, but it would just be really interesting to pick up on that again, um, exactly what sort of processes you go through in terms of inviting peer review or getting external input. Um, yeah, so for the Nature Front Half Guide, we don't really have a system for that. It's, it's more um, when something comes up. Uh, we're quite reactive, so when something comes up that we haven't thought about before, um, 
I will do some research and if necessary, I will kind of approach an external uh, specialist. So I did um, at one point uh, talk to um, a trans journalist association to get some input on how we were talking about trans people. Um, and uh, you know, as, as I've mentioned, the, the uh, I, I approached members of our diversity task force who had a number of different perspectives. Um, but we don't, um, we d yeah, we don't have a, a, um, a, a process for doing that. But I think the uh, the wider company group um, for their for the Spring and Nature Wide guide that will be being made public, um, they do. Um, th they've kind of written all their sections of the guide, and they are then putting them in front of um, various specialists and uh, members of the company who have a particular interest or um, uh, you know, specialism. Um, to, to make sure that it's okay. Mm. Thank you, Anna. Um, Lisa, did you want to come in on that? Sure. Um, I, I, I think ours so far has been quite similar to what Anna described in that it hasn't had any formal external peer review. We're still in, we're a couple of years behind you, I think, and um, we're still um, at the stage where we're trying to get input from our team and from other teams within the company um, and various task forces um, representing some of the groups discussed um, to get it to a stage where we're, we're kind of happy with it. We've, 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 we've um, identified anything that was difficult or any, any gaps. Um, but I think, yeah, the next stage, um, bef you know, definitely before we share anything externally, which we haven't done yet, um, we would want to um, yeah, get, get external people involved, maybe author groups who are working on relevant topics or editorial board members. Um, or maybe some kind of formal peer review. Um, so it's been really interesting to hear from mm -hmm. yeah, the other panelists about how they, they've handled that. And it sounds like um, Kim probably has more insight into this from your work mm -hmm. that you did as well. Well, I think the, the C4 disc group was specifically sort of put together to handle this. And there are a lot of people within the group. I mean, it's the, it, there are representatives from about 30 different organizations, not just publishers. It sort of spans academia and associations as well. So there's a lot of lived experience within the group, but there's also a lot of sort of connections and networks outside of the group that that group are tapped into as well. Um, but like you said, there's been no kind of formal peer review. It's all been very much more of a discussion, I would say, than a kind of formal mm. formal process. And I think that's probably how it will continue. Mm. I think it's worth um, saying that I, I mentioned I started my guide in, I think, 2017. And at that point, it was kind of viewed as a niche Thing mm. within uh, certainly within our company, um, and I don't know more widely. So I was doing it and, and continue to do it alongside the rest of my job, um, and didn't have any kind of outside resources for it. Now there's, I think there's there's definitely a growing uh, sense that it's very important and needs to be in integrated across um, so kind of everything we do. So hopefully there's going to be at, like as as that awareness grows, there's going to be more resources um, and more ability mm. to to get that input. Yeah, and hopefully more more discussion as well, and yeah, panel sessions. Yeah, I think as well something Kim just said about you know the fact that it's going to be an ongoing discussion mm -hmm. with peer review. It tends to be kind of one and done. Yeah. You know, you do it yeah. once and then it's published and then that's it forever. Whereas with this kind of um, project where it's an ongoing thing, it's I guess it's you, you'd have to do it something periodically to kind of mm. um, so that could be quite a lot. Of, I know it's a big investment of, yeah, of time yes, and resources, so a bit different to the normal peer review. Yeah. Well, it's an ongoing investment. I suppose yeah. that's the theme that's coming out of this: is that it's that it's ongoing, it's ever evolving, that you need constant input and discussion around it, mm. and that it's very hard to kind of have a clear one one answer. That it it very much depends on context and and input. Yeah. Um, I'm slightly conscious of the time, so I think actually we might um, move on to questions, if there are any. Um, if anyone has a question, do raise your hand, and I think that there is a roving mic. I think the mic's coming. <laughs> so if you'd like to introduce yourself quickly and then ask a question. Sure. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name's Simon Holt, and I'm the Disability Inclusion Lead at Elsevier. Um, Thanks very much for really interesting discussion so far. I guess I, I wanted to ask the panelists how you accounted for different definitions and standards um, in different parts of the world. So if I think about something like disability, for example, the definition isn't uniform um, and the language people use isn't uniform either. Mm -hmm. And so what might be acceptable in one country is unacceptable in another. 
and even um, the other way around, what is normal to talk about in one country really isn't no normal to talk about in another. Um, and I wondered, especially thinking about the C4 DISC um, mm -hmm. toolkit, how mm -hmm. you've managed to account for those kind of nuances. It's a really interesting question, thank you. Um, Kim, would you like to start? It's a really, really interesting question and not one that, again, like everything, <laughs> there's not one answer. I think, the, again, the C4 DISC working group has representation from across the, across the globe. It's not just a traditional kind of publishers from the USA and the UK. There is, there is really genuine global um, participation. But you're absolutely right. There's, there are things that are acceptable in one particular culture that are not in a different one. Um, and I think you've, in my, in my experience anyway, it's, it's been about having the discussion with the person that's created the content about why they've used the term, what the context is behind it, um, uh, whether they understand and appreciate how that might be received elsewhere and mm -hmm. sort of trying to find a compromise that, that doesn't take away anybody's agency. Um, and it's, it's not a one size fits all. I think that's, that's the, the, the theme that's really coming out is it's, mm. it's got to be about discussion. Um, so I, yeah, I would say it's, it's consultation and discussion really, that's the way that we've handled it. And I think always, al it's always going to have to be because there is never gonna be one uniform way to describe you know, anything. So, and and it's, it's also, as you stated a few times before, it's about um, allowing people to own their own labels as well regardless of how they, uh, how that label might be perceived by others, if it's their, the way that they choose to describe themselves, that's, you know, we should absolutely respect that choice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we, I was very conscious when I was writing my guide that, of that question that there are, people do approach things and use, use different labels in different countries. Like, um, one thing that came up quite recently was the, the question of identity first versus person first language. Because um, when, when I first started Nature, we definitely, we used person first language. So person with people with disabilities um, but it's sort of been increasingly drawn to our attention that not everybody prefers that people would a lot of people prefer to say they are you know disabled people on the basis that they are disabled by society rather than inherently having a disability or for other reasons um, and particularly with autism um, some people prefer to say person with autism a lot of people prefer to say autistic people and we have people writing in on both basis um, we've, we, we sort of had uh, an article by someone who identified as, a, as an autistic re researcher and we got someone writing in saying you should use the term researcher with autism and, and we had to reply to them actually this per this person prefers to d identify themselves in the way that we've used um, and for sure like in different it's different in different countries and for different groups and basically whenever we're setting a standard we will again do our research and go to sort of groups run by um, people with that condition or that or that experience uh, to see what they prefer to say and, and take it, try and take as a wider sample as possible um, and uh, use what is most widely used but also allow that flexibility um, for um, people to use other terms if, if appropriate. Mm. Thank you. Um, Lucy, did you have anything to add on that? Um, yeah, just that I, I think, I think again, it was on our minds from the start that there was variation between different um, geographical contexts and we s specifically set out to try and um, find out what was happening in different areas as part of the research. But you do have to acknowledge that, yeah, even though we're an international journal, the group of people who's working on this are mainly people based in the UK and they're, and they're going to have a certain bias there. So mm -hmm. if, you, if you have that, and, and also the, I guess, the bias in terms of the sources we might easily come to um, are, are going to be coming from a certain perspective. So you, you do have to make a conscious effort to, um, to look for sources outside of that. And then I guess, yeah, we do, um, we do have colleagues in other offices in, in, mm -hmm. in the US, in China, in uh, South America, so um, I think, yeah, an important part of like the later consultation will be maybe drawing it to their attention and getting mm. getting input. But even within even within you know different departments of the Lancet, Kim was talking about um, the importance of um, the communications uh, staff being mm. involved, which is something that we've now taken on because it, it, it it's actually because they're dealing directly with people in um, with, with the media in different countries. Mm -hmm. They are aware of some nuances um, and differences that we might not be, especially kind of in America. 
um, where obviously there's a lot, especially to do with race, there's a lot of, um, you know, uh, con terms and, and uh, expressions that are very loaded in a way that we might not yeah. have, even though we're trying our best to understand, we might not have registered. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's as far as we've got. Great, thank you. Um, I can see some more hands up. Um, we'll start with the gentleman over here and then, yeah. Hi. Oh, gosh, that's loud. Uh, Tony O'Rourke in Argo. A, a comment and a question. Uh, the comment is we, we edit thousands and thousands and thousands of papers every month, and the time we have to spend explaining the importance of inclusive language to, um, to authors, particularly in Asia, uh, it's, a, it's a real issue. Trying to, they, they, they don't understand kind of the need for it. Um, so whether there should be sort of global standards in place that universities and research organisations um, introduce to new postdocs when they're starting research, when they're thinking about their research, so that they avoid these issues moving forward in terms of their use of inclusive language. Thank you. Um, would anyone like to kick off? Yeah, so I, th I think to an extent that's what C4DISC is trying to do, um, while accepting that there can never be one unified answer to everything, to provide at least something that everybody can point to, and that, that it's rep you know it's representative, built by a group, um, and I think that's going to be really really useful for us to be able to kind of while you while you want to be able to have that individual conversation with everybody, you're absolutely right. We're all trying to do things faster and better. Um, so to be able to create a kind of template that to an extent says this term is potentially problematic according to the style guide used across the industry, blah, 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 we would suggest alternative term is, is probably the way I would see that kind of challenge being addressed. Um, but I do think you, you, the industry needs to accept that there still needs to be room for that discussion and you will get authors coming back saying I don't don't buy it, I don't like it. Um, that's not actually happened in my experience, but I'm sure it will. Um, mm. and, and we need to account for that and, and make sure that we are open to having those discussions when they do happen. Mm. Thank you, Kim. Um, Anna and Lucy, was there anything you wanted to add? Or not really. I think um, the, the, the basic rule, um, I would say, is respect people's dignity. Um, and uh, as long as we can, um, I think there's always going to be discussion about how the best way is to do that. But I think as long as we can get buy-in that that is a, a good approach, um, I think that, that will help us move forward. Yeah, I'm, d I'm just looking forward to seeing um, some of the wor work that Kim's described yeah. because I yeah. think it, it's become clear from our discussions that we're all trying to do similar things kind of mm. in parallel. But um, having knowing that there's a project where this is all joined up is, um, is really going to be, I think, helpful to people who don't have the resources to spend a lot of time on that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And I believe we had one more question from the lady there in the middle. Hi, I'm Deandra Roberts from the Royal College of Psychiatrists. Um, I'm also a DEIA associate editor, and I was just wondering how do you navigate the use of terms like BAME, and especially if it's being written by somebody who's not within one of those backgrounds, because um, I personally try and avoid the use of that term. But I just thought, what are your opinions on that? Thank you. Um, okay, thank you. For us, that's the kind of term we would only use if it was um, kind of integral to the data collection that we're talking about. So if people have done a survey that has used that as a category, then we would repeat that, but we, we, we wouldn't use it um, ourselves. Uh, we, t we tend to try and avoid lumping people together in one big category um, because it doesn't reflect the real experiences people have. So wherever possible, we will name the actual categories, whether it is uh, black British people or, um, you know, um, Sioux people or you know rather than saying indigenous people we will try and name the groups and not, you know we'll try and be as granular as possible to reflect what actually is happening um, but occasionally we you do kind of have to say underrepresented people um, because you're talking about a wider group um, but yeah we wouldn't um, wouldn't spontaneously use BAME. Thank you. Yeah, I think that I think that's a that's a kind of an, an issue that sprang to mind as well when we, we were talking about between country differences because obviously different terms have been popular in in different countries uh, in during recent discussions and and also very quickly um, the the problems associated with um, use of those terms both because they're kind of vague and unclear and also as you said kind of lump people together in a way that's that's often not appropriate. 
um, yeah, have, been, have very quickly become clear. So this mm. is a, just an example of a um, something that's been quite fast moving and quite different in different areas. And it's been important to kind of explain those terms in the guide and explain why they might not be appropriate. And, and as you say, circumstances mm. where they might be. Kim, did you have anything to add? Exactly the same. The guidance is really about not, not using a kind of umbrella term and trying to go for precision um, wherever possible. So yeah, totally, mm. exactly the same approach. Great, thank you. Um, I think we might have time for, for one quick question, if there is one. Uh, we have a hand up over there. Hi, I'm Sarah McKenna from OUP. Um, it sounds like all of you kind of did this almost as like a bottom-up initiative, very much grassroots. Do you think that's been a more effective way to kind of achieve these wider company buy-in, or do you think it would have been better to have that kind of top-down initiative to kind of give you more resources and be able to pull these things together? Very good question. <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, I think for us, um, because the company is so vast and there's so many different needs within the company, I think having something imposed from top down would have been very difficult. Um, and I found it with the, the attempt to roll out a guide to the entire company, people are asking, uh, you know, this, this doesn't apply to us, how do we, you know, what should we do instead? Um, and it can be quite difficult, but I think it would have been a lot easier if we had had buy-in for the resources um, from the beginning, um, because it, it is very difficult to kind of filter things up. Um, uh, so, so you needed a mixture, really, of people who understand what's happening on the ground and what the needs are of the of the various publications. But also, definitely, we would need. Mm. Um, you know, I I would love it if I was given, um, you know, take some of my duties taken away, so I could really devote myself mm. to this project. Um, like with buy-in from the higher-ups and have the ability to kind of go out and, and say to people, look, you need really need to up your game on this, um, which I don't have the authority to do at the moment. Um, so, yeah, a, mi a mixture would be good. <laughs> mm, thank you. Um, Lucy or Kim, do you have anything to add? Just, just that I think, I think in our experience, grassroots has been more successful, mm. um, but that success is predicated on buy-in at the very top, and until you have that, it's very, very difficult to get these things kind of to really take flight and um, so you kind of need somebody on the ground to have the idea but then very quickly somebody higher up to really buy into it and, and kind of sell it and give it the gravitas that it needs to be taken seriously within the organization mm. a bit of both thank you yeah i totally agree i think um you know we've been lucky to have a, a large team of copy editors to to draw on and they're the people who are looking at the details of words every day across a load of different journals, load of different topics, and they're, they're quite diverse group, and they are um, passionate about this. Um, they, they're, um, they're in touch with what's going on outside. Um, so they're really well placed to kind of do the research, to make the judgments, and to know what's actually, um, what, how it actually applies. But yeah, I think um, the resources are, uh, yeah, a, a point where it, it just becomes clear that you need you need more um, support in order to expand this and, and make it something that's more widely meaningful yeah okay I think that um, brings our session to a close and we're we're out of time but um, thanks so much to everyone for coming and for those excellent questions and thank you to the panel for your fantastic answers um, so I believe that there is a short five minute break now and then the next session will be in here chaired by Jane Marks. So thank you.